Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. For countless parents, the journey to unschooling has redefined childhood and transformed their family relationships. Are you curious? Together, let's explore what living and learning looks like without school. Hello, explorers. I'm Pam Larickia, and it's the 29th of June, 2022, as I record this intro. This week, we're going all the way back to episode seven to revisit a wonderful conversation I had with Anna Brown about parenting. I had been inspired by one of Anna's conference talks and was so excited to dive deeper into these concepts with her. We talked about uncovering underlying needs during conflict, validation and empathy, assuming positive intent, letting go of set outcomes, noticing our triggers, the 90-second rule, and finding trust in our children and in unschooling. These are powerful tools and strategies no matter where you are on your unschooling journey and no matter the age of your kids. In fact, these ideas can help create a strong foundation for any relationship. And serendipitously, much of our conversation around parenting tools aligns closely with what Anna and I and our community in the Living Joyfully Network have been talking about this month. Our theme is navigating conflict, and we've been exploring ways we might navigate conflict with a bit more grace and compassion, both for ourselves and for those involved. First, we talked about exploring our triggers and how so often they aren't really about this moment or the people involved at all. They are about us. It can help to remember that it's a trigger, not a threat. That said, we don't mean ignoring them, but rather processing them outside of the conflict. Next, we talked about the value of having no set outcome when navigating a conflict. When we go into a conversation with an idea of what direction we believe everyone should take, what usually happens is our energy shifts the whole power dynamic of the moment into one of power over. For me, moving away from my plan means getting curious about other possibilities and how others are seeing things. Anna mentioned that her mantra, be kind, not right, helps her open up to other possibilities without yet needing to release the idea of being right. (laughs) Then we talked about the idea of assuming positive intent, which looks like trusting that the other person is doing their best in this moment and they are trying to meet a need. They aren't trying to frustrate us. They're trying to figure out how to help themselves. When we can remain connected and curious, we can cultivate a collaborative space to work together to meet everyone's needs. And then we dove into validation. Validation is such a magical tool and it works so well because everyone wants to feel seen and heard, period. And it's important to note that validation can't have an agenda or set outcome that we're striving for either. It's most helpful when it comes from a place of truly wanting to understand the other person. If you'd like to dive into our conversations around navigating conflict in the network this month, just go to livingjoyfully.ca forward slash network to join us. Our conversations were all recorded so you can dive right into whatever piece of the puzzle you're struggling with right now. We would love to walk with you on your unschooling journey. And I hope you find my conversation with Anna interesting and helpful. But before we dive in, I want to take a moment to thank everyone who has chosen to support the podcast through Patreon. And a big welcome to new patron, Carolyn Coppersmith. Hi, Carolyn. I deeply appreciate all my patrons. Your generous support is instrumental in keeping the podcast archive freely available to anyone who's curious and wants to explore the fascinating world of unschooling. If you'd like to join my community of patrons and scoop up some great rewards along the way, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash exploring unschooling. And now let's hear from Emma. Hi, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca, and today I'm here with Anna Brown. Hi, Anna. Hello. (laughs) It's great to have you on the show. Anna is a longtime unschooling mom to two lovely daughters. I met her online years ago through the Shine With Unschooling email list and have really enjoyed connecting with her more deeply over the years. She gave a talk a couple of years ago at We Shine that I loved, and I'm excited to dive into it today with her for the podcast. 
But first, I was wondering if you could share a short introduction to you and your family and how you guys came to unschooling. Sure. So um, I live in North Carolina with my husband, David, and we have two daughters who are teens now. They are 16 and 18. And we really came to unschooling through our oldest, who had kind of a difficult start um, with her birth and lots of kind of dire predictions. And we just got home with her and wanted to be with her. And life really changed from that point on. But as she grew and developed, she had this I don't know, this drive to learn and take in information and do. And we just really follow that and ran with it and saw that traditional schooling wasn't going to be the best spot for her. And at that time, I stumbled across some John Holt, thankfully, and some other things that just said, you know, watch your child and facilitate that. And it really just started us on this beautiful journey that I'm so grateful for every day. And so we're just living and learning and exploring the world together. And it's a lot of fun. <laughs> it's definitely fun, isn't it? <laughs> the first question I'd like to ask from your talk is about finding the underlying needs when a conflict arises. We've probably all experienced times when just asking hasn't worked. Often even adults aren't good at verbalizing what real needs they are trying to meet by engaging in a conflict. How do you go about discovering the underlying needs at play at, in a conflict? Well, for me, I feel like it's a lot about observing and remaining open. Um, a while back, I read about a question that was posed to a psychologist who's a fan of a gentler approach to parenting. And so here was the question that was given to her. Um, my child refuses to turn out the light. I feel it's a waste of energy, but nothing I say is working. So the advice that the psychologist gave was to remove the light bulb. And then she went on to explain that the solution worked because the child became scared and then she learned her lesson, basically. And so I think this is a really great example where you can kind of peel back and look at what it would look like to explore the underlying needs. If I don't get anywhere from asking the child specifically about the behavior or, you know, to stop the behavior and that's not working. What I do is I'm kind of start looking more closely and watch for clues. So it could be as something that she simply forgets. You know, if that's the case, I could work with her to figure out a reminder. Maybe a sign on the door would be enough. Um, it could be that the light's hard to reach. You know, she's leaving the room. She's got books in her arms. She can't reach the light. So maybe rigging a string to the light or a push button light, you know, that might solve it. You know, in this case, what's interesting is we're given this additional information that she was scared and that she, quote, learned. So knowing that she was scared, I'd really want to explore that piece with her. Do you feel safer with the light on? Is it that you don't like entering a dark room? You know, I don't really love doing that. Um, <laughs> yeah, questions along mm -hmm. those lines serve two purposes, you know. So basically, it helps me kind of get to the bottom of the behavior, but also connects me with her. Like, she knows I, you're interested in what my experience is. And then I can learn, like, how she's seeing the world and what her perception of the situation is. And I kind of can gain a better understanding of how our perceptions may differ. So at that point, we could look at what about a nightlight that comes on automatically when the room gets dark or a switch to maybe LED type lights that don't cost very much, you know. And so in the end, I may say, you know what, those few pennies a day to leave that light on, I'm okay with that for her to feel safe there. You know, I think what's key with any kind of conflict is to move beyond the surface conflict that you see right off. So with this, we have one person wants the light on, one person wants the light off. Well, those seem, you know, kind of diametrically opposed views. But when we're able to kind of peel back and say, okay, what's happening underneath of that, we can find something that feels good to both parties. And so that's what I love about looking at the underlying needs. But so often we ha we're faced with these situations that seem like, again, complete opposites. How are we ever going to bridge the gap? But when we start looking at the needs that are driving the behavior, usually we can find, ooh, but what about this and what about this kind of opens up that creativity piece. Um, I think something also that I want to say here is that there's sometimes physical needs at play. And so there's something called HALT that you've probably heard of that um, stands for hungry, angry, lonely, tired. And so, so many times, especially with children, but not just with children, <laughs> these four things. Um, <laughs> you know, are present when we have a conflict. So it can be just a quick test to see, have we all eaten recently? How long has it been? 
did something else happen, maybe an upset from yesterday or this morning that's kind of coming out in this new conflict? Do we need connection? Has it been a while since we've all really connected? Are we all kind of doing our own thing and we need that reconnection time? Is it time for a nap or bedtime? You know, sometimes we found it was just enough to change the energy of a conflict by saying, let's go get a snack and talk about it. <laughs> you know, And then we could sit down and have that snack and everything looked completely different after the snack. And that's especially if you're like me and get grumpy when you're hungry. <laughs> so <laughs> my husband and children know that about me. So they're very quick to offer a snack if needed. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, again, it's just, it's that type of thing. So it's not, you know, we have this conflict and if we're just looking at what we see instead of, you know what, sometimes we just need a break or we need some food or we need some rest or we need a change of scenery. You know, those kind of things can help us diffuse a conflict situation and keep it from, from getting worse. Yeah. And it's, so often or surprisingly so often that all those other pieces, those environmental pieces, those, um, you know, just things that have gone on in the last 24, 48 hours, other things going on in, in your life that, that contribute to these things. So I think it really, really helps to take a moment to, to try and piece all those uh, yeah. other things together. Yeah. <laughs> some space for it too, you know, just space for you're tired space for you had a bad day yesterday or this morning or a difficult fall mm -hmm. or something, you know, just if you give space for that, that's something you can each learn for each other, you know, to give space to each other. And, and we've really seen that with our dynamic here, kind of understanding, Oh, she had a tough experience at this thing. And so let's give yeah. her some space around that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, when you're feeling, when your child's uh, upset about something, I know uh, in my experience, it's, it's not very hard to feel sympathetic right. and to acknowledge their feelings, right? You know, um, the challenge for me, had, I've, or as I've seen it, is that often what we do when we see someone's upset um, is that we want to jump in and try and fix things for them right away. And and then we wonder, why? well, why are you staying back there? Why are you staying upset? I've got like solution right. A, B, and C <laughs> over here for you. <laughs> and as part of uh, research for the book that I'm writing right now, I've been reading some more about empathy. And empathy is about feeling with the person. Mm -hmm. So so you acknowledge their emotion, but then you connect with the person on that level, helping them feel heard and understood where they are. And it reminds me how in unschooling circles, we often talk about validation, which is the step of acknowledging a child's feelings as real and valid and connecting with the child where they are and then moving forward when they're ready. So how do you see the process of validation playing out? Well, I will say sometimes it plays out like magic. <laughs> so, um, you know, I feel like we all want to be heard and the bigger and the scarier the statement or the behavior, the more it needs to be validated. And for me, validation is really just taking the time to truly hear the other person. And often it's helpful to reflect back what you hear, but not always. You know, I think it depends on the person. Sometimes just sitting quietly and letting them talk is really what they need. But what it can't be at that point is jumping in too quickly to solve or to defend, you know, any buts, 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 you know, moving too quickly mm -hmm. to, oh, I've got this great solution can just lead to defensiveness, the person not feeling heard. And it really kind of immediately shuts down that connection. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to hear our little ones say things like, I hate my sister and I wish she was gone. You know, but instead of saying, oh, but she loves you and she didn't mean to upset you and explaining something away, you know, it can be really helpful to say you are just so done having a sister. You wish you would mm -hmm. never come back ever. And sometimes, you know, you'll be met with this. Yes, that's what I want. <laughs> and, you know, but but other times, you know, just that feeling heard what we found time and time again was actually this kind of backpedaling. Well, I don't want her to be gone for good. You know, I just want her out of my room, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, OK, that's something we can do, you know, and, uh -huh. and allowing this expression helps somebody move through it. You know, I and I think, you know, one time I had a friend visiting and she was not a parent at the time. She is now. But the girls were very young. And, you know, this kind of conflict broke out while she and I were talking. And, you know, she heard it. It was like, I, you know, I hate her. I'm mad. And this really, really upset. And, you know, I walked down and I'm talking and, and I 
I'm talking to the girls separately and, and, you know, I'm just like, I get it. You're so done and this and that and validating those feelings. And, you know, two, three minutes later, they're running down the hall laughing and playing. Mm -hmm. And my friend's like, what the heck just happened? (laughs) Like, (laughs) like how did we go from there to this? And I said, you know, it, it was just that little break was needed, that little validation that, you know, this upset happened, you're upset about it. And we just found that time and time again, just truly being heard just allows you to like, and especially children, I think as adults, sometimes we hold on to things a little bit longer. But with young children, they just want to move on, you know, they want to have fun, and they want to get back to that place of joy. And so just hearing them gives them kind of that, okay, I can just move on and go through that. And I think it's also important for parents to realize that, you know, I don't have to own it or agree with what they're saying to hear it and validate their experience. You know, that's sometimes people get stuck. Well, I don't want to be saying things about the other child or whatever. It's not Mm -hmm. about that. You know, it's just about hearing what that child's saying and just validating it. You don't have to own it or feel the same or agree with it. Um, I also think validation and reflection is a really great tool to help us make sure that we're understanding each other. I know for me, I found it very valuable in the past when someone reflects back to me what they're hearing from me, because sometimes it's very different than what I'm intending. And when I can hear that reflected back, I go, oh, okay, wait a minute. (laughs) You know, that's not what I was trying to say, but wow, you know, they're hearing it very strongly in this way. And it kind of helps us start clarifying and getting to this, okay, here's where we're differing and here's where we can kind of come together. And so I find that valuable for myself, for someone to reflect back what they're getting from me so that I make sure that I am, you know, coming across as intended. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that's a huge one for me too. Um, when I made the shift um, from seeing communication as what I'm trying to say Mm -hmm. and saying it over and over and over to make sure that it gets through to shifting it to looking at the other person and saying, well, what are they hearing? Right. And when there's a disconnect between that, it's like, oh, now I know what I can do. Now I, now I've got somewhere else to go rather than repeating the same thing over and over again. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was a couple other really cool pieces in there that I just wanted to bring out again too. Um, I found the, uh, the piece about how sometimes you're not, to, uh, validation isn't always about talking because, right. you know, some, right. some people aren't talkers. Mm-hmm. And, and I know, uh, here I found sometimes it was just about sitting with them or, or standing right. near them, just being near them. And they were doing the processing and the val- the validation was in being there to support them right. as they were, you know, going through the whole range of their own emotions and working their way through it and understanding it themselves. And just being there with them is what really helped them. I agree. Then, yeah, I think yeah. it's that giving the space again. You know, yeah. Just oh, yeah. Because you're holding that space for them right there, yeah. right? And they can feel it and they know you're there and they know if they need anything from you, they can ask. But that you're just there kind of almost like witnessing yeah. the process yeah. available. And then the other piece that I also found really useful um, was was the, you mentioned separate, validating with them separately. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Because, you know, they're, they are going to say things, um, you know, that if, if a, their sibling, brother, sister, whatever mm-hmm. was in the room with them would, would uh, probably feel the need to defend themselves. Right. Exactly. Right? Hurt feelings so, and defensive. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, like you said, you don't have to take on what they say. You're validating, reflecting for them and understanding why they say that or feel that or whatever in that moment without, you know, doing it in front of somebody else who may take it a different way. Yeah. No, I agree. So, yeah. (laughs) Um, ah, another question for you. What is the 90 second rule? Okay. So fun, fun. Okay. (laughs) So (laughs) this is a concept that I first heard about from a friend who was reading Jill Bolte Taylor's book, My Stroke of Insight. So Dr. Bolte Taylor is a neuroscientist who had a massive stroke and she wrote a book about her experience, which is a fascinating book for anyone that's interested in that. Um, But one of the things she talks about is the 90 second rule. And she explains that whenever we have a reaction, be it fear, 
joy, anger, that our body is flooded with chemicals to react appropriately and that it takes about 90 seconds for those chemicals to flush through our system. So when we can think about it, you know, it's hard to even hold a belly laugh for more than 90 seconds. So, (laughs) you know, if we're stuck in a place of fear or anger, it's because we're choosing to buy back into this feeling to keep triggering that reaction from the body. You know, and, and I mean, I'll just say, wow, because it was so empowering to me. Now, I personally am a natural observer, so I found that I often sit with my reactions and kind of, hmm, look at this, you know, and I find Mm -hmm. that I'm able to choose my next steps pretty easily. You know, I'm able to, like, let go of things and choose and let that initial reaction run through me. And what I found when I was communicating with people is this disconnect where they were like, but I I don't know how you do that. I can't do that. And, you know, it was nice to have this kind of physiological foundation because what I found with some people is they react very quickly. And so they're buying back into that feeling really before the 90 second passes. So they haven't had a chance to feel the shift or that chance for choice. So they're Mm -hmm. left feeling there is no choice. I am just angry and I am going to remain angry, (laughs) you know, but for me, understanding that physiological process you know, can help with that so much. And it helped me to understand other people that weren't able, you know, that thought, no, there's not a choice in this. I'm just angry. And I'm thinking, but I feel a choice, you know, what's the difference? And I think that was it, you know, that was truly it just this 90 seconds, because, you know, after talking to some people that did react differently, you know, this 90 seconds, they were like, oh my gosh, you know, and they tried it and they found the same thing. So basically, you know, to everyone listening, I would say, you know, next time something happens that makes you really mad, feel it and watch the clock at the same time, you know, (laughs) and you'll, you'll feel this shift, this slight shift. And that's your chance to choose the different reaction. And, you know, I want to say too, at this point that sometimes we want to keep buying back into it and that's okay. But knowing that it's this physical reaction with the clock, you know, and that I'm making a choice makes all the difference to me. And there are definitely times when I want to stay right there in that place Mm -hmm. of anger or sadness or fear or whatever it is. But it's so powerful to know that I'm making that choice versus something's happening to me. And so that's what I love about that little insight from her. Yeah, really, because it, it it does help you shift and see that you can you can find choice inside right. those moments. That's that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, another thing that you mentioned in your talk that really stood out for me because I also found it to be such a helpful way to approach things was to recognize that everyone is doing their best in this moment. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So for that, I think about it in terms of assuming positive intent. And so I, cause I really do believe that everyone is doing the very best they can at any given moment. I just think it's kind of our human nature. We're doing the best we can. And sometimes that's mm-hmm. better than others based on what's yeah. going on around us, but it's the best we can in that moment. And I've also found that how people are behaving usually has very little to do with me, (laughs) meaning that they aren't specifically trying to thwart me or make my life harder. And I think so many times we jump to that when someone's behavior is impacting us. It's a personal attack. It's they're out Mm -hmm. to get me. They're out to ruin my life. You know, this is horrible. Look at, you know, and this, you have these buttons pushed. And so what I love about, you know, assuming positive intent is I'm kind of can take that personalization out of it, excuse me, and know that, you know, they're doing the best that they can. And when it comes to our children, I think it's so helpful just to take that deep breath and to realize that they're doing the best that they can. And they're not trying to stop me from getting my needs met, that they're really just trying to meet their own needs in the best way that they know how in that moment. And when I can see that humanity and see that they're struggling, it makes it so much easier to validate and to find, you know, ultimately the solutions to whatever this upset is and solutions that meet both of our needs. And so it takes that defensiveness out on my part and theirs, because a lot of times when behavior is impacting us, we immediately to feel defensive and we're going to defend mm-hmm. our you know, needs till the end. And it's like when you can just change that ever so slightly to see that humanity and know, you know what, here we are two humans trying to meet our needs. Let's do it together. You know, it just really changes the energy. 
Yeah, that's that's a great point. Instead of uh, instead of seeing everything um, that they're doing from from our perspective right. only, yeah, because you can, like you said, you can just feel like you have to defend yourself, defend yourself. I think um, it's so common. I mean, I think it yeah. to me it's just kind of human nature. It's just like we all want to defend, and and sometimes you'll see even I find myself doing it. Like when I feel backed into a corner, I'll be just defending things that I'm like, why am I defending this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. But it's like, but somebody's coming at me. You know, that's your mm-hmm. first kind of go to instinct, and so I think it's just really helpful to kind of peel that back, and 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 that reminds me too, just to say that you know this is helpful outside of families as well. You know, that little shift of understanding can diffuse so many difficult situations, be it a customer service situation, a work experience, you know, a neighbor conflict, you know, whatever it is, that slight shift to this person isn't attacking me, even though it seems like it. They are trying mm-hmm. to meet their own need. They are dealing with their own baggage and difficulty from that day. We're two humans trying to meet our needs. How can we do that together? Yeah, that's a great point. And uh, just shifting it slightly mm-hmm. um, from defensiveness to when when you and your child are at odds, it can also be quite tempting just to try and maneuver things a little bit so we can get the outcome that we think is best. Yes. <laughs> yeah, even if we don't come right out and say it, you know, the thing is, kids can sense our agenda, can't they? <laughs> Yes, and they can. Uh, that can get in the way of their learning, right? When they think they're trying, when they are now reacting to your manipulations, and that can also undermine the trust that we're developing in our relationship. So, how? else can we approach those moments when we think we really have the right outcome in mind? Right. And, and I think it's so important because, and, and for me personally, I do tend to be kind of the control freak and like to control mm-hmm. all the outcomes because, you know, that's just who I am. But what I know in dealing with relationships, you know, be it in my family and outside, I really need to remind myself kind of at every turn that, you know, not to have this set outcome in mind. Because I, I really, truly believe that I don't know what's best for anyone else. You know, I know what's best for me, but I don't know what's best for anyone else. And so if I go into a conflict situation with the desire to lead everyone to, you know, my lovely solution, mm-hmm. basically, I mean, the discussion's over before it starts. And by having that outcome, even having that outcome in my mind, basically, I'm shutting myself down to any new ideas or approaches and can kind of get caught up into defending my idea versus is listening to the other person. Whereas if I can remain open, you know, and hear what's happening around me, it fosters this environment for others to do the same. And, you know, something else that comes to mind too with this is it, it's, and again, it's a huge oversimplification from, but Buddha talks about attachment leading to suffering. And again, it's a complex idea and, and a different system, but I found it still a helpful reminder because basically my attachment to things being a certain way can lead to upset. And if it doesn't happen that way, and so there's my suffering. And if instead I can remain open to how things actually are and what's in front of me and how can we move forward, you know, I just find myself a lot happier. And I think too, remaining open and flexible fosters this environment of creativity And for me, finding solutions, when we're working together to find solutions that work for everyone, it's this fun, creative work and that needs that space, that safe space of creativity. And and didn't you find that when you were able to do that, um, you were able to stretch so much more? I mean, I know I learned so much um, by seeing all these different things that they came up with that really were literally better than what I thought was the best solution. Absolutely. <laughs> Before we set out. I mean, holy. <laughs> well, and so many times, because again, I kind of tend to be this left brain person and I, you know, mm-hmm. I have these ideas, you know, I'd come in and we'd have this conflict over something and I'd have in my mind this fair solution. Okay. We're mm-hmm. fighting over the TV. Well, 30 minutes for you, 30 minutes for you, 30 minutes for you. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm having in my mind. Now, luckily, I'm keeping quiet about it, but, you know, and listening, but I'm thinking this is the type of solution that we need. But what I found when we were all just open, like, okay, what works for you? What works for me? They'd come up with, 
you know, off the wall. Okay, you take it for two hours. I'm going to go out and ride my bike. And I'm thinking, what? How did we get here? We were just fighting over the TV, you know, five minutes ago. But but when we're in that open environment, and, and I think there what's really important is this trust that we're all going to get our needs met, that we're all going to be heard, and then we're going to keep kind of working at it until it feels good to all of us. And and they're so creative. I mean, they're just, they they want to find solutions. And, and I think something else that brings to mind there when we have, you know, because you and I both talk to people that are kind of starting out on this journey a lot, that's something that comes up is this, I don't think I can solve everything. You know, the parent thinking, I don't have all the answers. I don't know how to stop them from fighting. I don't know this. And, mm-hmm. and what I try to say is it's not about that. You know, it's creating this safe space where you're all working together and it takes some practice and some time and, and I think time, especially to develop the trust that we truly are listening, that we truly don't have an agenda, that we're open to what the solutions are. But once you see that open up and you see that fostered, I mean, the ideas are just endless. There's so many different solutions and it comes faster and faster as you start living this life. Yeah, I mean, at first it can almost look alien. Right, you right. can't imagine <laughs> that what people are telling you will happen. Mm-hmm. That, that's never going to happen in this situation. Exactly. I know, but but you're right that the time and it, it it really is to kind of develop the trust right. between people that this is really the way it's going to go and we're going to consider, you know, all sorts of ideas. And so it's, it's really, it's really fun to watch. That's one of the things I love, you know, about the first couple of years as people come to, it's like, holy, I had no idea. (laughs) It's true. Speaking of the journey, one of the most empowering ideas on mine has been the realization that everything is a choice and, but really, really, really everything is a choice. Was that a big one for you as well? Oh my gosh, such a big one. And oh my gosh, yes, really, really ever. Really, really. (laughs) Really, really, I promise. You know, and at first people really buck against that idea because, but when you first look at it and you start to kind of deconstruct it, you see that truly at every turn, you know, we have this choice of our reactions and our next steps. And we touched on it a bit with the 90 second rule, you know, just understanding that we choose our reaction is this critical first step in this to understanding that everything is a choice. And I think where people can get stuck here is that they have this idea that there are have tos. And, you know, when you examine that statement, it's like, huh, it falls a little flat because, you know, this is a phrase that we use a lot in our culture. I have to go to the store. I have to finish this assignment. I have to wash the dishes. And while it may seem like a little word and a word we say all the time, really it's kind of insidious because it creates this trapped feeling that makes us believe we don't have a choice. And when you flip it around and change your language a bit to say things more like, oh, I need to go to the store because I want to have, you know, chicken for dinner, or you say, you know what, I'm going to skip it and eat some leftovers. It takes the weight off the have to because you're reminding yourself of there's choices. And in every situation, there's always multiple choices. Um, You know, I like having the dishes clean. I like them out of the sink, especially before the next meal, because I, you know, I'm cooking a big meal for everybody and it's nice to have that clean canvas. But do I have to do them? You know, no, I don't have to do them. I could ask for help, somebody else to do them. I could pay somebody to do them. We could use paper plates that night. You know, we could go out to eat and say, forget it. It's too messy. I don't want to deal with it. You know, and when I focus on all those other options, then I can make the choice that feels best to me. And in that moment, it might be, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and clean the dishes now because I want to make that meal we were talking about. Or, you know what, I want to leave them because we're going to go out to dinner. And so it just, it has such a different energy to it, that feeling of choice versus the weight of the have tos. And I guess weight kind of reminds me that should is another really powerful word that gets into our heads. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot 
along those same lines. And I think shoulds often come from other people. We can should ourselves, but when you peel back the layers, a lot of times it's coming from things you, expectations, you know, from other people. And so I have a couple things I ask myself when I'm facing a should um, that I find helpful. And basically, first of all, where is it coming from? Because sometimes I think I'm saying it to myself, but again, when I peel back those layers, I'm like, huh, that's really coming from what I think this person's going to think. And Mm -hmm. does that person have an agenda for me? And and it just helps me kind of deconstruct that a little bit. Um, I also say, can I authentically say that I want to do this thing? And if I don't, then that's a red flag for me. Okay, what what's that about? You know, explore that a little bit more. Does it feel expansive or constricting? And f- for me, I just find that to be a really important litmus test for anything. It kind of keeps me in tune with my personal guidance system. And not everybody is in touch with that or has that experience. And I think looking at those physical sensations are really helpful. Like, how do you feel when you think about doing this thing? Does it make you feel big and you're smiling and you're going, that's going to be the best trip? Or does it make you feel like, oh my gosh, that seems horrible and all these things I have to do. And so it's just those, okay, you know, listen to those little, little guides from inside. Um, Another one for me is, can I do it with joy? Because I truly want to approach things in my life with joy and delight because I feel like it makes things so much more fun Mm -hmm. and just keeps that energy where I want it. And if I can't do that, then again, that's another red flag to examine. Now, I still may choose to do whatever the thing is, even if it doesn't meet these criteria, even if I can't do it with joy, but checking in with myself helps keep me on track and not sucked into someone else's agenda or some sort of self-shaming that can happen, um, you know, when we start to have these shoulds and have to start to weigh us down again, because I think it really boils back to that choice. Then I know, you know what? Yeah, this feels hard, but I'm choosing to do it because this is what I feel like doing. You know, this is for this reason, I'm going to have this outcome or whatever it may be that why I might make that choice. But I think it just, I think that's why I find choice so empowering. And I believe that we always have a choice because it just changes that energy to I'm choosing to do this. I'm choosing to go to work. I'm choosing to finish this. I'm choosing to do that because this is what I want to do, you know, even when it feels like it's a task that can be difficult at times. I just, I just went through the, that whole shift myself this morning. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because uh, I'm pretty sure I mentioned to you, I've got a deadline for my book coming up to get it to my editor. And that I didn't even realize, you know, I was having fun, having fun writing. I I know I have, you know, lots more that I want to do before I send it. But that was starting to feel like a have to. Right. And I didn't I didn't realize it at first. But what was starting to happen is that every time I, you know, stood up to go and do something else, like get ready for this podcast, like, you know, anything else, um, I was starting to feel guilt and shame for doing that. Mm -hmm. And then what was happening was then when I, even when I sat down, it was hard to get started with writing as well, because that all that negativity was like, you use the word constricting. Right. And that, that really, it's like, oh yeah, that's exactly what it felt like, you know? And, and then it was even hard, even when I was sitting down, it was hard to get to work. But the minute I realized what was going on, that I had lost, uh, the feeling of choice, right? everything opened up all of a sudden I could do, you know, oh, it's okay that I choose to, you know, wipe down the table before I set up for yep. the, the podcast, you know, and, and choose this and choose other. That doesn't mean that's not time taken away from my writing. You know, this exactly. is a time that I'm choosing to do something else. And all of a sudden now when I sit down, I'm sitting down with joy and excitement to get to writing and then I can actually start, you know, so <laughs> It's such a huge, it's, it's amazing that that one little shift to realizing that this is a choice, you know, even, even with deadlines, even with whatever, yeah. these are still choices that you're making in every moment. And that brings back 
the joy and even just the energy that you put into everything that you do. Right. And I I mean, for me, again, it's that weight. It's like when you feel that weight. And I think a lot of times we don't, like you said, you didn't really even notice it till suddenly you're like pinned to the floor with the weight of this have to, and you're going, how the heck did this happen? You know, (laughs) like, how did we get here? But that shift to saying the choice and deciding what I found is that when I'm listening to that and making the choices that kind of bring me joy and connect me to the people around me, suddenly it's like time opens up, things change and things flow so much faster. And so what I was making hard by, you know, saying it was a should or a have to really becomes easy when we're following that flow. You know, you may have needed to just focus on the podcast and cleaning the kitchen or doing something else to open Mm. up an idea that's then you're going to run with when you go back to sit down to write. And that's just how that process works. Instead of forcing yourself to sit there looking at the screen, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No flow flows. Amazing. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Another important part uh, for me that uh, I found in de-schooling was uh, developing trust. So that could be the trust in the process of unschooling, trust in our children, trust in ourselves. And why do you find that so valuable? Well, I mean, I think for me, trust, I I find it this place of calm and peace. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I like that I know this place is kind of waiting for me when I choose trust, you know, trust in myself, trust in my children, trust that we're exactly where we need to be, and trust that that things will work out when they need to. And and that doesn't mean that everything's rosy all the time, but even in the dark times, I have this trust that things will turn around and that I have the ability to do that, to choose and to see the way out of the place back to peace and joy again. You know, I, I guess I find trust is just kind of this quick touchstone to get me back into the frame of mind that brings joy you know, back into my life. And I think a big piece of that is bringing me back into the moment, <clears throat> you know, and I think you know, unconditional acceptance comes into play here too. You know, I think we all want unconditional acceptance. We have the power to give it to ourselves and to give it to others and also to see and accept the situations in front of us. And I think a big part of getting there is trust. So I really see those two intertwining, this acceptance and trust. And again, I think they're these touchstones that bring us back into the moment with our children. Yeah, that's true. And there's another piece of trust that that I was just thinking about. That's, um, you know, often when people first come to unschooling, we talk about, you know, trust, trust the process, trust it, trust it. But sometimes I, I get the impression from, you know, how people are talking about it is that they're using trust almost like an armor to get through situations. It it reminds me, we were just using the word constricted, right? Right. right. I, I, I can kind of feel them like they're closing in on themselves to trust that things are going to work out fine, you know, and, and they're just kind of closing off to get through the moment. But for me, developing trust was actually about building, um, a, a bunch of experience, right. you know, this was something trust that developed and deepened over time. And it was completely by um, really connecting and involving myself in the more challenging experiences and seeing how we reacted to what we felt, you know, working, brainstorming our way through it. it. It was the actual, it was the actions and the connections of us that helped me develop more trust in us. I even see it in my kids, the trust that they develop in themselves, having gone through these situations rather than kind of holding trust up as like some sort of shield or something. Right. Or something to hide behind. You know, I think it's such a great point and that it isn't a place of isolation. You know, it's this place of bringing us back together you know, so that we're working together and we're trusting this process and our kids are seeing that. And it's all because I think you're right. And I think you see it with some people that are newer to the journey or or aren't, they're saying, I just trusted it's just going to work out hands off, you know, this. And it's like, no, it's not hands off. It's like, that's when you dig back in. That's when you reconnect. And I think, you know, something I think you've talked about before is when you've recognized that, you know, shaky moment that not trusting it, there can be some disconnect there. And it's a sign of like, wait a minute, we need to reconnect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great way of looking, looking at those clues. And yeah, it, you really have to, uh, trust isn't a substitute for engagement. Right, right. Maybe there's a way. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I think that's really powerful and important. Yeah. 
Now, uh, sometimes also we're reminded that the things that we're doing are very unconventional. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, they really are. And and we can find ourselves feeling anxious and unsure. Um, what helps you move through those moments? Well, I mean, I think we've talked about some of those things already. Um, mm -hmm. One that we that haven't really come up yet is gratitude that I want to talk about. Um, and it's such a game changer for me and somewhat related, Titnot Han talks about the power of a smile and how it actually changes brain chemistry. So, you know, sometimes I just start there with a smile, you know, and looking around my environment and looking at what's going on around me and look at my kids and my husband or our life and finding that joy because, you know, even on the hardest day, it's there. And, you know, if you're having trouble finding it, you know, I turn to the small stuff, you know, it's the sunbeam or the last from the next room or the breeze signaling that spring's coming. You know, sometimes it's just that I have a soft bed waiting for me at night and it's time for this day, long day to be over, you know, <laughs> and that's okay too. You know, but at any moment we can find these things to be grateful for. And in doing so, I think we open up our eyes to more things and suddenly we're seeing all this beauty and this connection and this life that we love around us. And, you know, I truly believe that where we focus, you know, where we, what we focus on is what grows. And I choose to focus on joy and connection as often as possible because of that, you know, and in doing so, I'm attracting others that find joy and who want to find joy. And you know, we show people the true reasons for our choices, that it brings us joy and that it brings us connection and that they can do the same. And then I feel like, you know, it doesn't seem so unconventional after all this life that we've created of connection and joy and living our passions. Yeah, that's a great point. You know what? Because now when I think about, you know, think back over the times when, what would I do when I was feeling that? Mm -hmm. I think very often I would, I would just turn back to my kids. Yeah. Yeah, now that I realize it, it, I would probably be more apt to feel those, feel that anxiety and, and feel, oh, Jesus is really different when I was feeling disconnected from them, you know, because I, because I wasn't totally, I wasn't connected to what, what we were really doing. So if I, I would just go sit in the room and hang out with them and I, like you said, I'd see them laughing, mm -hmm. I'd see them playing, I, I would see them learning. I would right. see them, it's like, oh yeah, this is the point. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's not to worry about, you know, what everybody else is doing. This, this is really the root of the point. Right. This is that richness of everyday life, those conversations and the rabbit holes and the connections that happen because we're here present together. You know, that's the beauty of it. And I think it really does quiet that noise from people outside that don't understand what this life looks like when we just come back to that moment and see, yeah, this is pretty great. You know? <laughs> <laughs> is it, cool? it, it really, it does often like come back to connection. Yep. We've we keep coming back to that so often in, in a lot of these, these topics. That's very cool. Um, one of the other challenges I want to ask you about is uh, hot buttons. Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned them a little bit yeah. earlier. Uh, these are the things that we react to almost unconsciously before we even realize what's happening. Yet on our unschooling journey, uh, as we start to gain more self-awareness, I know for me anyway, I began to see those automatic reactions as overreactions to the actual situation right. that I was involved in in the moment. And then, you know, I didn't want to do that to my family, right. bring all this other stuff to it. So what are some ways that we can change that up? Well, I mean, first of all, I think it's a, it's important to even be aware of hot buttons and to find mm -hmm. what your hot buttons are because we all have them, okay? Yeah. <laughs> and it is that thing that's said or done that instantly you're reacting to or like you said, more accurately overreacting to. And, you know, I think they can develop from some different places. You know, sometimes it's serious. It's past trauma. You know, I have a friend um, 
who struggled with the physicality of her young son at times because of an abusive past. And she had to recognize that her reactions were coming from this past trauma and not about what was happening in front of her and not, you know, what was happening with her son. So when she was able to see that, his actions stood alone and she was able to find a way to work together so they could both feel comfortable without putting that baggage on him. But, you know, just the very definition of hot button is just this quick reaction. You know, we come out Mm -hmm. and I think it can startle people. And so it just helps to be aware. You know, for me, a biggie is the treatment of children. So I have this gigantic justice button (laughs) (laughs) and I can put up with a lot of things. You know, I think, oh, I'm this in person. I accept a lot. I trust people on their paths. But man, you start talking ugly about children (laughs) and I tend to like get really really upset. So I know this about myself and I'm able to recognize it and kind of calm myself down. And while you'll still find me advocating for children whenever possible, I don't need to bring this overreaction and this all of the poor treatment of all the children in the world onto this person in front of me who may have honestly just had a bad day, you know? And so, you know, that awareness is really all it takes to see them as passing thoughts. And that allows that 90 second rule to play out so that I can choose my next steps and my next actions. And hopefully it will be something that's connecting. You know, hopefully I'm able to recognize "Ah, hot button here, let's get through it. And then so I can choose a reaction of who I want to be in the world. And I think a tool that's helpful for me with that, with the 90 seconds and with, you know, dealing with the hot button are mantras. And, you know, I think they can really help us when we're getting through the 90 seconds and and through a hot button that's been stomped on. (laughs) So, um, (laughs) you know, and and I think obviously each person mantra is going to have to be different. It's about finding that simple phrase that can kind of instantly calm or ground you or change the energy of a situation. So I'm just going to talk about a few of my favorites and then that may get people thinking about what might suit for them. But um, the first one that I want to say is it's there pl- there's plenty of time so i can especially in my earlier years was type a get everything done you know and and i can really get caught up when there's time pressure involved and i put that stress on those around me we can't be late we got to get going what's happening we're going to the park it's time to have fun damn it you know <laughs> and so it's like wait a minute you know step back there's plenty of time it's okay if we're late to the park you know <laughs> and just reminding myself of that kind of instantly calms me and you know what do i want this time time to be about, not about me rushing to, you know, meet this deadline that doesn't even really exist. Um, You know, I'm exactly where I need to be is another one. And we'll give the shout out to Amy Steinberg. (laughs) Lovely song. Um, But this one is so helpful just to get to that place of trust and acceptance again. It's like, it's okay. I'm I'm right here where I need to be. This is where my journey's taken me. This is where, you know, I'm learning something here. And so that kind of helps ground me. Um, be kind, not right is another important one for me. So this is back to kind of my justice buttons and also that I tend to be a debater. And so it's helpful to remember that what I really want to be is kind and compassionate person who looks for opportunities to connect and is less worried about proving that I'm right. (laughs) And so that's just, again, why these are so specific to people, because that's that one that speaks to me. Like, you don't have yeah. to be right about everything, Anna. <laughs> you can be kind to the person, <laughs> even if you don't agree with what they're saying. And so that helps me. And just one more is, you know, all as well. And this one reminds me, of course, of our dear friend, Anne. And, you know, honestly, just that alone puts a smile on my face. Yeah. I can <laughs> hear me so clearly and hear her laugh and her smile and her easy energy. And it just, it for me, it's about that foundational trust again. And it's just a quick way to get back there and feel the peace and calm that truly trusting can bring, that just all is well. And this is a beautiful life that we have. And I think finding those phrases or words that kind of instantly ground you can be so helpful. And so I think it's worth, you know, putting some time into that, looking at your hot buttons, looking at what kind of sends you into those 90 second loops Mm -hmm. and, and figuring out a way of something that can just bring you out of it, can just ground you, can bring you back to the moment and kind of out of your head. So I think it's, it's a worthwhile exercise. Yeah. Well, even if I know sometimes I used to have like a a little, just a stone in my pocket or, you know, even, yeah. yeah, Or, or something through my head. And the, 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 another nice piece is, you know, when you're kind of, when you're open about it, 
you know, which we are explaining what's going on, you know, our, our kids start to understand that as well. Cause I know one of my hot buttons is like quick change. I'm not very good with change. (laughs) And that's something that, that my kids learned that, you know, I would warn them (laughs) and as I was learning about it too. And, you know, that 90 second rule, that's really cool coming up again, because, you know, they would come, they would come to me and they say, Hey mom, you know, what if we did this instead? And you know what, I'll give you some time to think about it. (laughs) And off they went (laughs) because they knew I just needed, I just needed those few minutes, like one minute, three minutes to just process through that. Yep. You know, to, you know, whether you call it hot button, you know, whatever you call it, because they knew if they demanded an answer right away, I just, it, it would be like, no, right. I can't, I can't see my way through it yet. <laughs> yes. How it's going to work. We have this other plan, you know, but right. Given that time to kind of, okay, wait a minute. We, you know, we don't have to attach ourselves so strongly to this one outcome again, you know, there's that, mm-hmm. and, yeah, no, you know, no. we can be open to this different outcome that I hadn't thought of. Yeah, no, that's super cool. I love it. Well, I want to say thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today, Anna. (laughs) I could really, truly listen to you talk about unschooling and relationships for hours. (laughs) Because you know what? I find your perspective is both inspiring and grounding at the same time. It's really cool how you managed to do that. So way to go. (laughs) Well, thank you. I have a good time talking to you. So it was lots of fun. Lots of fun. And just before we go quickly, uh, where might people be able to connect with you online? Well, so I have a few old things, papers and essays and some links and stuff at a place called um, choosingconnection.com. And it might be possible to connect with me through there or you can find me through Shine and Facebook, I guess, if anyone needs to get me or they could even probably find me through you if somebody needs me. Yeah, sure. Oh, well, and if anybody has further questions, you can always, uh, they can always comment on the page for this episode and I will tweak Anna. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I can answer that. stuff there so I can look there. And then also we have the cool Q and A stuff each month, you know, so if people, yeah, it yeah. would be fun to that's talk a, about that too. Yeah, that's, that's a great idea. Stick your questions in the Q and A. We're lining up for one of those at the end of the month. Yep. Thanks very much, Anna. Yep. Thanks, ma'am. Bye. I hope you found this episode helpful on your unschooling journey. And be sure to check out the growing podcast archive. The conversations never go out of date. You can find more information about my books, the Living Joyfully Network online community, and the Childhood Redefined Unschooling Summit online course at my website, livingjoyfully.ca.